Hey everyone. So raise your hand if you are scared to draw with a ballpoint pen. Most of you are probably raising your hand right now at the screen or mentally. What I'm going to show you how to do today is use this. It's just a standard big ballpoint you can get at CVS. And I'm going to show you how to draw confidently with it. Now before I get into the nitty gritty on different techniques you can use with the uh, ballpoint pen, I just want to say that you can truly do some beautiful things with it. And one of the things that you can do is that when you put the lines down, every single line is going to be nice and crisp. So it's, it is a little different than sketching with a pencil. But there is a double-edged sword to everything. So while everything does look more crisp and more clean, you can't really shade with it like you can a normal pencil. And then two, once you put those markings down, they are down. There is no taking them up. All right. And to be more specific about that, th there are erasers that can erase pen. But why in the world would you want to do that if you're drawing with a pen? Just commit to it, which is the first part of this video that I want to talk about, and that is commitment. So you notice that the, the lines that I'm putting down, you'll see this weird wavy shape here. I'm actually going to be drawing a dragon. And in doing so, I am allowing myself to kind of add to my imperfections of what I'm drawing here. Now the great thing about drawing with a pen is you don't really know what's about to happen. And that's, that's actually a good thing because if you want to be a good sketcher, if you want to be a good artist, of course, artist is, I mean, that's subjective. Uh, like painting is art and sculpting is art. But if you want to be a good sketcher, that kind of artist, then you need to be able to accept everything that you put down on the paper. You need to be able to give yourself permission to draw the lines. And then if something doesn't visually strike you, don't automatically chalk it up as a failure. Because what that does is that you put the notion in your head that, well, I guess this whole thing is ruined now. It sucks. I can't shade it anymore. It doesn't look like everybody else's awesome drawings that I see in Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, World of Warcraft and Game of Thrones and Reign of Fire and all the other dragon stuff that I see. It's like, that's totally not the case. Each one of you drawing you are your own unique artist. Nobody in the world will draw creatures like you. They won't draw dragons like you. So you have to accept all the marks that you put down. Okay, so far, I didn't really have an intended shape that I wanted to do for the dragon. All I knew is that the dragon is gonna be facing us or maybe twisting its body around in some kind of crazy fashion. I don't know. Maybe I drew it too big on the page. And then here is where your conscience actually toys with you a little bit. All right. Because my original intent was to show all of the wings on here. Well, I don't know if that's the case. I can't do that. However, what I can do is just build off of what I drew by using really light gestural lines here, just to give me an indication of the overall silhouette, maybe some muscles here and there. I, I also, my pinky is going to be my guide hand or my guide finger. Okay, so that means that when I put it on the paper like this, I'm not putting all of my weight of my hand down with the palm of my hand. I'm keeping it up a little bit. Now, a pen doesn't smear nearly as much as pencil as long as you let the ink from the ballpoint dry. Okay, just keep your hand away from the image as much as possible and it will further guarantee that you actually have a clean drawing. But I'm holding it lightly so I'm not gripping this sucker so tight that I'm pretty much gonna break it in half. No, I'm gonna keep it light and I'm just gonna kinda walk my pen over. Now with a pen, like I said earlier in the beginning of the video, once the marks are down, they're down. Okay, so shading with a pen is gonna be a little different. There's no graphite at the end of this, you can't sharpen it. But what you can do is you can turn the ball 
slightly to the side and very lightly go in one direction and cover an area. It doesn't look like graphite, but you're going to start to notice that it does have a very good layering effect if you keep the same pressure. Now as I turn my page and I want to shade different parts of the gullet, or whatever you want to call that underneath, you know, lizards have gullets, whatever you want to call that underneath the chin, there is some really cool layering going on. It's a different type of texture than what you would normally have with a, uh, you know, graphite. All right, so once I go over that little area, I don't really want to go into too much detail about that area. What I do want to do is play up the ear section. All right, you notice that in the very beginning of this, I established some form of structure to the skull underneath. I'm, ma I'm making the, the jaw very pronounced and that eye very pronounced, okay. What's cool about dragons is that you can really exaggerate those bony landmarks and those nasal ridges and everything across there because like with dinosaurs, especially the, the newer paleo-accurate dinosaurs, you know, where they have more feathers now, um, there's not really a lot of exaggerated spikes coming off of it, you know, not like the Giganotosaurus or the early T-Rexes in like the Jurassic Park mo movies. But with a dragon, you can get away with that because anything goes. All right, so let's, let's just put some really cool little spikes in there. And then the second thing that I want to point out is with a pen, you can immediately get dark. Immediately. You don't need any other pencil. Like with graphite, you notice that I, I use uh, 4B, and then if I want to get really, really dark, I will use black Prismacolor. But with a black ballpoint pen, you can push that sucker hard, and then all of a sudden push it light and get a full range of values in there. All right. If those of you wondering what color I'm using, this is the black, so I don't, I'm not quite sure how this is going to show up on the, on the video, but we'll see. Also with dragons, it's, it's a little bit more fun to play with eye shapes. You know, you can have some fun with the scales that are around the head. Maybe put some protruding incisor teeth on the bottom and top jaw, just for fun, you know? One thing I like to do when I was a kid is the lips, I would put these little ridges just to let me know and let other, other friends know that was looking at my drawings. They're like, hey, these are the lips, everybody. This is where the mouth is. You know, when you're, when you're an amateur and you're first learning how to draw, you want to let everybody else know that you know what the drawing is about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, it's not supposed to do that. You guys know it's supposed to do this. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's part of maturing and growing up. I guess because I drew that, I'm, I haven't matured yet. <laughs> All right, so now that I have that, oh, it's kind of cool. So I, I, I need to make sure that the, the ear wing is on the other side. So I'm going to look over my drawing a little bit. Again, that's another trick that I want to point out to everybody is if you want to make a, a truly accurate drawing in perspective, whether it's organic sketching or hard surface, straight line sketching. Instead of having the paper away from your sight and then your head tilted so you can comfortably sit there and draw, you could still comfortably draw, but just sit up, have good posture, sit up. Those of you with standing desks, those are the best things to use because you can see directly over your paper so that you can see the, the horizontal layout in full view instead of having it tilted because like if you tilt your head and you try to draw a straight vertical line it's going to be tilted and it's you're going to not notice it until you stand up and you're like oh man this whole whole perspective is off all right so the other thing i want to point out with a ballpoint pen because they get so dark so quickly is use darkness sparingly until you are for sure that everything is layered correctly. So what I mean is, you notice that the under, under part of the jaw here, so this is the bottom jaw, I know that that is going to be the area of where a shadow would exist if the light source is coming down like this. 
So that means that with that darker line that I drew here, I'm just gonna lightly start to push off with some more value on that. Now, if you're wondering what kind of pen movement I'm doing, it's, it's hatching back and forth. Okay, so here, I'll show you on the neck. Let me see here. I don't wanna move it up too much. Um, it's just hatching back and forth like this. And then I'm gonna turn it, and then you hatch back over. So it's kind of like my lessons in uh, shading with a pencil where a minimum of three different passes in different directions will at least start a good foundation for the value. Okay. You wanna do the same thing when you have a blackened line and you need to fade value off from that line so that you do not keep it cartoony. I get asked that at least a couple times a month after, when I post drawings online. I'll, I'll read a comment and then it'll say, how do I keep things more realistic and less cartoony? And I have to say the same thing over and over. Quit outlining your work. Because things, when you look around in real life, nothing is outlined. So quit outlining stuff. Everything that we see by our eyeballs in the physical world is because of light and dark hitting it. That's it. There really are no hard edges. Okay, so think about how light is hitting the side of a rock against dirt versus... You know, if, if we can see it against grass, okay? What has the darker value? Well, probably the dirt. And then the grass and the green is, is slightly lighter, okay? So we can see the edges differently. One of the things that I like doing with a pen, if I want to get some texture in there, are lightly applied scribble marks. And that is, when you scribble these lines over top of each other, when you first start the movements out, it's not going to look good. It's just going to look like a hairball. But in time, when you start to layer those up, they actually are going to look good. Always remember that. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's have some fun here with this dragon. What if we do the neck and then it swoops around? Maybe it's a serpent. What if it swoops around like this? And then we have the tail. Oh yeah, this thing looks pretty gnarly. So see how light I'm drawing this first? I'm committing the line movement. Notice how they're bigger swoops. I don't want to do hair marks because I'm not trying to correct myself. All right, I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to make sure that I lay the line down because I can always build off of it. This is why it's so important to draw lightly at first. You can always get darker. You can never get lighter. Always remember that. Okay, these lightened lines in here where I had my original torso, I'm just gonna use that for something else. I don't care. And by not caring, I actually have a lot more mental freedom and just to, to have fun and to sketch. A lot of people get way too bent out of shape when they draw and it actually, it's not enjoyable because it they feel like it's a job instead of a passion. All right. If you feel like you're, you're trying to learn drawing, but it feels like a job and not a passion, question of whether or not you actually should draw. Like, do, do, you, do you like the idea of being a good artist? Or do you actually like the arting? Do you actually like drawing? I ask my uh, students that all the time that I, that I mentor on when they want to be a concept artist. I'm like, do, do you actually do you actually like the concepting part or do you just like the idea of being good at it even though you don't really enjoy it you know it's like if i if i watch somebody slam dunk a basketball i would love the idea for me to do that because i want to know what that feels like but i don't actually want to go practice slam dunking i just don't want to do it all right it, that would seem like a chore it would seem like a job it's just i like basketball it's just not, it's not in my blood. It's not my passion. So with drawing, drawing is. And if you, if you continue to struggle, I, I think that one of the biggest problems is, you know, you, you might be trying to take shortcuts into getting better quickly instead of taking the time to get better correctly. There's a, there's a big difference. Okay. I'm not really gonna put any more detail on that face right now. What I do wanna do is I wanna put in 
some some crazy looking arms. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to put in the sphere. If you have not seen my previous lessons, please go back into my lesson where I create a creature using simple spheres. Hey, you know what would be fun? What if we do six legs? Ooh yeah. So let's put the hip up here. Put the hip up here. All right, so we're gonna have a little bit of fun here and that involves putting some normal arms down for the dragon. However, I am going to give it wings, but since the wings won't fit on this page because it's more of like a magical serp, like floating serpent, let's just go ahead and give it some bat wings or bat-like wings and I'll go over the anatomy of a wing so you know exactly what's going on and how to do it correctly. So first let's put the the shoulder in there. All right, and and these these don't have to be super super, you know, detailed or anything. It's a dragon. It doesn't exist. So let's say that the dragon here has two main fingers and then it has one gripper in the back. Okay? So it's similar to a large bird, similar to an eagle, but not quite that. Notice how loose I'm keeping things because I just, I don't need to have a lot of detail for this. It just doesn't matter. What matters is that I have a, a cool looking silhouette and then we can go from there. All right, let's put some claws in there, some really cool looking claws. Always remember that when you do claws, that where it grows out of the hand, that whole area right here, that needs to be bulbous. That needs to show that there is a knuckle and an area located in there where the nails can actually grow out of and then the secondary knuckle. Okay, and then you have the hand up here. All right, and then I'll just indicate some shading with some hatching. I still wanna be relatively neat with this. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna have too many scribbles cause then it'll be too messy. But again, I just want to leave some areas open for interpretation. All right, again, th this is not a, a real creature. Okay, it's just some floating serpent and we're just having fun with it. But the other thing, and I'm totally guilty of this, the other thing about designing uh, dragons is that the body parts, it really any creature for that matter, the, the body parts should all be accounted for. I used to skip doing that. I used to just make certain areas of the creatures ambiguous because I didn't want to draw it. It's like those of you that, that know you can't draw human feet, you tend to hide the feet. I used to do it. <laughs> Whenever I would draw a character, I would just put it standing on the ground and put grass over it because I didn't want to draw the feet. And then with the hands, I would put some kind of article of clothing in front of the hand and then I wouldn't draw the hand. It would give me an excuse to hide it. So you want to hold yourself accountable for all the body parts. Which is why, a little little side note here, this is why designing hands and feet for creatures is so vital. Because there's a lot of originality that could be had in that. Everybody draws the same feet. Okay, hooves, three-toed, um, something spiky like for an arachnid. You know, but you want to try to be, try to be unique with it. Okay, so we, we will put another arm in there, but I do want to go over the bat wing anatomy. And then I'll, I'll add in some, you know, some bird anatomy too. But let's keep the wing super small, just for fun, just for fun. All right, so we'll do, uh, this top part right here is called the propatagium. So the propatagium, like you, you'll have a small shoulder here, okay and then the forearm, all right, like this. It's the skin that connects the shoulder to the, the wrist. Okay, it's the propatagium and it, and it straight, straightens out. And then you have the wrist, so let's do like a small little finger, why not? We'll have like a bat serpent. Okay, and then that goes all the way down like this. All right, now, th these are all fingers, actually, in a bat. So these are all fingers. Okay, you're gonna have one main one that kind of floats up there. 
And then you're gonna have the, the large finger right here. Now the skin directly next to it, and then the, the skin that's layered, and it's really, really large at the very end of the wing, is called a dactylopatagium. You know, think of pterodactyl. So pterodactyls had it. Um, I know, these are some strange, strange words, but that's what it is. It's, it's the dactylopatagium. And I'm gonna show you how to connect those. So you just draw the second finger coming down here. And you're gonna connect it. Notice how light I'm keeping things. All right, now, the, the main knuckle, or the main finger that comes down, is usually gonna come straight down. So these two areas in here are called the dactylopatagium, okay? Now, the area that connects this on a bat usually would connect to the leg, but that's called the plagiopatagium. There is no leg here, the, the legs are in the back up here. So it will not be collect, or connecting to the plagiopatagium, it will be connecting to the side of the body. Okay, because it, we, I mean, we could add, let, you know what, let's add a little finger in there. Why not? That would be the leg. And then that little bit of skin that would connect to the main body, that is called the uropatagium. All right, so maybe that's like a very, very thin membrane. Sure, why not? Okay, and then you have your latissimus dorsi or your lat. Okay, it's, it's not a human, but there are plenty of mammals in the animal kingdom that have the latissimus. Okay, it's, it's the Latin muscle that connects all the way to the small of the back, runs all the way down, and then your traps are up here. So it definitely needs some strong traps. So, in conclusion, up here you have your propatagium. These two areas, you have your dactylopatagium. This large main area is your plagiopatagium, and then the connective membrane slash tissue going from what would be the bat leg to the body is called the uropatagium. Okay, so you have a lot of tagiums going on there. All right, look these up too, because they're really fun, and also they're fun to draw. So just, I advise all of you, if you really want to become a creature designer, you got to study the creatures and the animals that actually exist in our animal kingdom because you're going to get very, very versed in the body parts. The more you know about the body parts, the easier it is to bend the rules when you start inventing creatures from your head. You just have to study what exists. Now, always remember that. Just study what exists and then you can bend the rules. You can't make up rules. I had somebody the other day ask me, what's the best way to draw creatures from your imagination? And I said, reference. And they replied, no, I'm talking about making stuff up from your head. And I said, you can't have anything made up from your head unless you have real reference to pull the memories from. You can't make up anything. And if you do, it's going to be completely wrong. So you have to always remember, get that reference in. Isn't this great? Like, th there's no eraser. There's no eraser. I'm, I'm just scribbling, having a good time, talking to you guys. Hopefully you're drawing along with me. That's what I really hope. I, ju I just hope you guys learn the value of sketching freely, allowing your brain to relax. Quit trying to perfect your drawings. When you try to perfect your drawings, that's when you screw up. When you are not thinking and you're just doodling and having a good time, that's when you do your best work. Quit trying to make everything perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect drawing. All right, so now we have one, two, three, and the, okay, let's put an indication of where that claw is in the bottom for the other leg. There we go. All right, let's put in the other wing. I'm gonna make sure that I'm looking over my sketch. Also, uh, just a little, just a little side note, something that you definitely should watch out for as you're sketching things, is that if you have an appendage on a creature or for whatever it is, and you look at it on the other side of the creature, make sure that the direction of the appendages poke the opposite way so that it looks more, uh, or it's more realistic. This knuckle up here, this finger coming out, is going this way. Okay, I'll put a little arrow. So this one obviously has to poke the opposite direction. You don't want to accidentally do it both ways. Self-editing, guys. Okay, 
So here is just my indication of some deltoid muscles right up in here. Now if you want a little rundown on some wing anatomy for a dragon, if you were to make it a little bigger, I'll just put a little, uh, little sketch down here. So let's say you have the shoulder. Okay, there's the deltoid, tricep, bicep, forearm. Okay, how do we add the wing from that shoulder? If we were to draw an actual dragon for poking out. Okay, so you have your, your supraspinatus. Okay, so we'll just put like a little indicator right there, supraspinatus. And then you have the flexor ale major. It comes above the shoulder. Okay, you got your deltoids right here. So this big sphere is your actual deltoid. Back here, your tricep. Back here, your bicep. Then you have your brachialis right there, okay? Let's break that up into what a human arm would look like. Okay, so under here, it's the supraspinatus. Top here, um, you have your flexor ale major. Okay, and then you have your tendons coming off to the joint. And then, um, in the back here, you have your latissimus dorsi. So that's what I was talking about, the lat muscles back here on the, on the serpent. The only difference is all of these muscles for the wing, it, it can be condensed into this smaller area right here. Because if, if a dragon were truly to fly like a bird, okay, you would have your, you know, your hollow air sacs right here within the wing so it can float. All right, and all that, all that fun stuff. That would be another lesson because I, I have some lessons planned where I'm going to be showing in detail a real westernized dragon, you know, something from Game of Thrones or something, something big and scary. Okay, but right now, since we're doing a serpent, everything is condensed and we just have an elongated body, which is equally as cool. I love serpents. I think they're really cool. And I don't think they get a lot of credit, especially in Hollywood. So, yeah, here it is. Anyway, let's get back into this little or big dragon. Let's do the thigh up here. Just a basic shape. Put a little kneecap in. Right, and then I'm going to fold the ankles back and I'm going to have your toes. Okay, so you're going to see two of them. There's actually going to be three toes physically, but it's going to be wrapped around that ankle. Okay, and then you have your the heel here. It's going to be a little different because this the leg is bent as if it's a quadruped, which technically, yes, it could be a quadruped, even though it's going to have six legs. We're not going to be able to see that that leg in the back, but what we will see is that spine. And I want to indicate where that spine is by drawing a very, very light line going across the body. Now, why would I need this spine? The spine is a good visual tracker. If I put something on one side of the body, how am I going to duplicate it in perspective on the other side of the body? How do I know where the spine actually is? This little line definitely helps. Because if I want to start putting in a row of really awesome, badass looking spikes, I know where to put them. Okay, I can start walking them down the neck. I'll put everything so you can actually see it. I have to constantly look in the, uh, the camera viewfinder so, so nothing is you know, like off screen. So if some of the stuff that I draw, like if I move it down and I'm talking about something way down here, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, I want to put a little stronger of a hump back there at the brachia or not brachialis, the uh, trapezius muscles, because this is where all of the shoulder joint, you know, you, get, you got your clavicles down here, you got your huge neck muscles, you got your trapezius, you got your latissimus dorsi, they all meet in the back, so you're going to need a strong back, especially for a dragon. All right, so once I have that, and I'm going to darken up this is why I love drawing with pen. I'm going to darken up the, um, the spine. And actually, now that I'm looking at this, depth-wise, I think my dragon is going to benefit from having a double row of um, spikes on the back. We're not going Godzilla, but we're going... We're just adding depth. Like, there's structure on the other side of the neck instead of making it look flat. And I'm going to indicate maybe some where, where some scales could exist. Because I will be drawing indications of scales on this thing. 
Now it's like I, I started this drawing not too long ago and, you, and you're starting to see the power of layering with a ballpoint pen. All right, no erasers, no freaking out. If I put in a scribble and it goes too far down than what I originally thought it was going to, oh well, let's see how we can work from it. Maybe these spikes that are coming out of the neck are attached to the scales that are now growing on the side of the neck. There, that just gave me an idea that I just didn't think about before. I'm just kind of going with the flow here, not really caring about the outcome. I'm not outcome dependent when it comes to my drawings, unless I am specifically drawing something that I have to have look a certain way. Like if I'm working for a client, we have already gone through the design phases and I'm working on a final sketch or something, digitally or traditionally, I need to make sure that it actually looks good. All right, so I'm just indicating with some single row hatching of where the bottom of the neck is. And the direction that I'm putting the hatching is rounded. Because when you, like with a pen, with a pencil you can get away with doing stuff straight. You just layer it on top of each other. With a pen, the lines come on the paper a little bit more deliberate. And when you have enough of them side by side by side by side, and they're rounded, then it gives the illusion that, oh, okay, even though he's drawn with ink or she's drawn with ink, you can see that there's a roundness to it. So there's some, there might be a muscle here and it goes back on the other side of the neck and that'll be fun. And I also want to change up maybe some of this area too. Like I always enjoy playing with the, the throat area. That's another area on creatures that doesn't get a lot of love. It's usually just the teeth and disgusting looking mouths and such, but um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Okay, let's see what else we can do. Yeah, so we have that, oh yeah, so let's, let's finish putting in the spikes. I'm just gonna put in one row for now. The other thing that I, I need to stress is that when you start to put in spikes on a creature that go down the spinal column, make sure that the direction that these spikes are pointed are in line with how the spine is wrapping around the creatures. Okay, so let, let me explain. All of the spikes that you see going down the neck right now, we see from side view. Why? Because we see the side of the neck. This is a pretty horizontal view of the dragon. However, as I move down the spine, the body starts to twist. We see the top of the back down here, which means that each spike that gets closer to that area turning you're gonna to start to see less of the side view, and I'm gonna to start to tilt them. Maybe they grow uneven to keep that asymmetry, asymmetry, asymmetry going. But remember, I still have another row in there. And now the realism is starting to come out. Okay, so once we have this, guess what's happening? You can, you can yell at the screen if you want. This wing that's in front, is blending in too much with the spikes. This is where depth comes in. So I wanna be sure to just darken that knuckle coming off of the smaller wing and I wanna darken the edges of that wing coming out because it's in front. And once you start doing stuff like this, you're gonna add depth and you won't even have to shade. Just add the depth, make it a little darker, fade it off, Remember those knuckles coming out, so just walk down the ink. What I mean by walk it down is just like thick to thin, thick to thin, thick to thin like that. It's a lot of fun. So now that we have the majority of our scribbles in, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to layer on some more details until you see this thing really come to life. So I encourage you to Watch along with me as I do this. It's uh, it's going to be in time lapse, so get your sketchbook ready. You can see how I layer it, and um, I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's go into some time lapse. <laughs> 